الحمد لله القدير الباري ثم صلاته على المختار وبعدها كسيرة الرسول منظومة موجزة الفصول. We stopped last week at the ninth year of the bi'tha, ninth year after really the revelation, which is well known in the books of Sira as Amul Huzn, the year of sadness for the Prophet because in that year his uncle, his protector Abu Talib died and in the same year, three days after that his beloved wife Khadija radiallahu anha died. So in, in, that, in this text Imam Ibn Abi Al-Aziz Al-Hanafi rahimahullah jumps one year after that, he says, وَبَعْدَ خَمْسِينَ وَرُبْعٍ أَسْلَمَ جِنُّ نَصِيبِينَ وَعَادُوا فَعْلَمَ He says, when the Prophet ﷺ reached 50 years, which is one year after the death of his uncle and his wife, the 10th year after Bi'tha, one incident took place, which is some of the jinn accepted Islam. And subhanAllah, the timing is very important for this incident because even though it's not mentioned here because it's very, as we said earlier, it's very brief text for the seerah. So <laughs> Prophet ﷺ now has no protection in Mecca. So he faced much more severe lashback from Quraysh. So one of the ideas that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to go to Ta'if. And Ta'if, if you don't know, is the one of the rivals cities to Mecca. One of the major cities in Arabia in that time. So the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, now Mecca seems impossible. People are not accepting Islam completely. We're still minority. We're still suffering from the leaders, the main, most of the people did not accept Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if trying to seek more help, trying to convince them, trying to present the message of Allah to them and see if they accept. And the, the narration is quite long for, for this story. I'll just give you the brief highlights. The Prophet ﷺ went to three people of, their, of the Ta'if major leaders and basically they mocked him and they replied in a very bad way. So, of course, they did not believe in him and the third one of them even said, if you're really a messenger from Allah, so you're much more magnificent than I talk to you. I don't want to talk to you. And if you're not, you're a liar. I don't, I don't want to talk to you. So in both ways, I'm not going to talk to you. SubhanAllah. And then they, they told their sufaha, their young people and the, all the, let's say, public to follow the Prophet Wasallam and throw stones in him. And so the Prophet Wasallam was hurt a lot by, by this reaction. And one of the authentic narrations, Aisha radiallahu anha, asked the Prophet sallallahu she thought that the battle of Uhud was the worst thing that the, the Prophet sallallahu has ever seen. And she asked him, what's the, the most severe thing that you have seen from Quraysh? Other, other than, she, she thinks that Uhud is the worst. But then the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this incident of Ta'if and what happened to him. And in his way back, he made a beautiful dua. Even though the narration is not authentic, but it's still it's, it's valid because it's mentioned in the books of Sirah. And this dua is very emotional dua. And it's very famous, well known. Allahumma inni ashku ilayka da'fa quwwati wa qillatih wa qillatih wa hawani ala nas to the end 
So the Prophet ﷺ was asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I have no power, I have nothing. It's just your power, it's just your message that I am trying to give to people. And then as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to reduce the, the impact on the Prophet ﷺ by sending some of the jinn to listen to the Prophet ﷺ reciting Quran and accept Islam. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how did the Prophet ﷺ know the verses that I recited in the first sak'ah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ صَرَفْنَا إِلَيْكَ نَفَرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ يَسْتَبِعُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Allah sent some jinn listening to the Qur'an. فَلَمَّا حَضَرُوهُ قَالُوا أَنْصِتُوا When they came and they heard the Qur'an, they said, wait, keep listening. أَنْصِتُوا means listen carefully, listen with paying attention. It's not just hearing stuff. You hear things, but then you, you, you start paying it extra attention and you understand what's going on. That's called insat. So that's the word ansitu. فَلَمَّا قُضِيَ وَلَّوْا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِمْ مُنْذِرِينَ When the Prophet ﷺ finished reciting, they went to spread the message to their people, to the other jinn. Subhanallah. So what did they say about the Qur'an? Very interesting. They said, قَالُوا, قالوا يَا قَوْمَنَا O oh, our people, inna sami'na kitaban unzila min ba'di Musa. We heard that a book has been revealed after Musa. What's the, what are the characteristics of this book? Musaddiqan lima bayna yadayh. It's confirming what has been revealed before. Musaddiqan lima bayna yadayh yahdi ila al-haq wa ila tariq al-mustaqeem. It guides to the truth and to the straight path. Subhanallah. And they, they kept on and on explaining to their people the, the main concept of this message, which is the concept of Tawheed, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And even in Surah Al Jinn, there are more details about it. When they say, We thought that. Man, humans and jinn will not tell lies about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they thought what Iblis told them was true. That's why they, they were not believers, they were not Muslims. But now they found the truth. So subhanAllah, this is the, the story that mentioned in our text, how those jinn accepted Islam in the... 10th year of the Bi'tha, when the Prophet وسلم, was 50 years old. Then he jumps to another topic. And he says, ثُمَّ عَلَى سَوْدَةَ أَمْضَى عَقْدَهُ فِي رَمَضَانَ ثُمَّ كَانَ بَعْدَهُ عَقْدُ بْنَةِ الصِّدِّيقِ فِي شَوَّالِ وَبَعْدَ خَمْسِينَ وَعَامٍ تَالِي أسري به والصلوات فرضت خمسا بخمسين كما قد حفظت. So here he mentioned three things, three events. The last one, inshallah, we'll talk about it next week, which is Al Isra wal Mi'raj, when the Prophet ﷺ was taken from Mecca to Bayt al Maqdis to Jerusalem and then to the heavens. Inshallah, we'll talk about it in details next week. But what are the two events he mentioned here before that? The Prophet ﷺ got married to Sauda bint Zam'a wa Aisha bint Abi Bakr radiyallahu anhum ajma'in. Even though here he mentioned that Sauda first and then Aisha. But wallahu a'lam, the, the accurate narration it's mentioned in the in an authentic hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmed that it's the opposite. Aisha was first. They were almost at the same time. But Aisha was first, then Sauda. So the, the hadith goes like this. 
لما هلكت خديجة جاءت خولة جاءت خولة بنت حكيم امرأة عثمان بن مضعون. When خديجة died, after خديجة died, خولة بنت حكيم, the wife of عثمان بن مضعون, came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. قالت يا رسول الله ألا تزوج؟ She told the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, Should not you marry someone? Do you want to marry? Basically, do you want to marry someone? What do you think? So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, Who? She said, إن شئت بكرا وإن شئت ثيبا. If you want a lady that has not married, yeah, has not married before, or you want a lady that's called Bikr, the girl that has not been married before. Or Thayyib, and the word Thayyib means uh, basically a widow or divorced lady. A lady has been married to someone and then she's not married anymore. So the Prophet ﷺ asked her, فَمَنِ الْبِكْرِ Who is the Bikr? Who, who's in your mind? So she said, ابنة أحب خلق الله عز وجل إليك سبحان الله she said even that's early in مكة we're not talking now in مدينة and after all this when أبو بكر is well known between all the Sahaba that he's the best companion that early on in مكة and this Muslim Sahabi knows that أبو بكر is the most beloved man to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم so she told him the daughter of the most beloved man to you, Aisha bin to Abi Bakr. And the Prophet ﷺ asked her, Woman is Thayyib? Who is the other, the Thayyib? Sauda was a believer, so she is telling the Prophet, Sauda, she believed in you and she followed you. Then the Prophet ﷺ told, Khawla to go and ask both of them and ask their families if they want or not, if they agree or not. So, فدخلت بيت أبي بكر. She went to Abu Bakr. And subhanAllah, this narration is very important because we have many people now thinking in, in, in modern minds. What they know as good and bad this time, what they know as laws, as common things, they just drag it to every single era. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in this era, it's incorrect, but still they apply. And you will understand what I'm talking about now when we talk about the age of Aisha radiallahu So when Khawla went to the house of Abu Bakr, she met Aisha's mom, Umm Ruman. And she said, فَقَالَتْ يَا أُمَّ رُمَان مَاذَا أَدْخَلَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ وَالْبَرَكَةِ This is how she presented the, the issue. She said, what a good and blessings Allah has brought to your house. She said, what's that? What are you talking about? She said, the Prophet ﷺ has sent me to ask you to marry Aisha to the Prophet ﷺ. So she said, just wait until Abu Bakr comes back. And Aisha radiallahu anha at that time was six years old. This is what I mean. Many people find this problematic. That how come the Prophet ﷺ proposes to a six-year-old girl? So in the same narration, we will see that that was very, very normal. Because in fact, someone else was talking to Abu Bakr before that, asking for Aisha to marry his son. And we will see that. Abu Bakr said, وَهَلْ تَصْلُحُ له? When Abu Bakr came back and they told him the same thing, he said, is it okay? Because he's my brother. So he thought that she's considered as nephew, so the Prophet ﷺ cannot marry her. And they asked the Prophet ﷺ, 
and he said, yes, he is my brother in Islam, but it's okay. It's allowed if I marry her. Then Abu Bakr radiallahu said that Al-Mut'im ibn Adi has talked to Abu Bakr before to marry his son to Aisha. And Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr radiallahu an, did not want to break his promise. So he went to <clears throat> Al-Mut'im ibn Adi. And when he entered there, the wife of Al-Mut'im said, Oh Abu Bakr, are you thinking that if our son or when our son marries your daughter, you're, you'll be able to convert him to your religion? So Abu Bakr said, talked to al Mut'an <clears throat> and said, do you think just in the same way that she thinks? And he said, basically, yes. So then Abu Bakr radiallahu had no commitment with them because obviously they, what they are saying that, listen, we're, we're not, we're going to marry our son to your daughter, but our son is not going to accept Islam anyway. So from now, so Abu Bakr said, that's enough reason to break the relationship. So the importance of this story, <clears throat> people who says, how come the Prophet ﷺ proposes to a six year old lady, someone else has proposed to her before that, the son of al Mut'am bin Adi. So that was very normal. And obviously, at the end of the narration, Khadija Aisha radiallahu anha herself says that the Prophet ﷺ married me when I was six years old, but we did not have the actual relationship, the actual marriage until I was nine years old. And subhanAllah, even today, not 1400 years ago, we have some ladies reach the age of puberty at the age of eight and nine. Today, not 1400 years ago. So, some people are trying to make a big deal out of this and they say, and unfortunately some Muslims are responding to this so-called problem in a very bad way. They say, oh, we have to review our literature and we have to, to rethink through it. And some of them came up with the idea that no, Aisha was 18 years old. SubhanAllah, they just came with the age that is okay to marry in, in the West, 18. It's not acceptable. We don't care about like what's the normal in the West, what's okay and what's not okay. It's our literature is there and the hadith is very clear. And by the way, the hadith talking about the age of Aisha not only this narration, it's in all books of hadith. Aisha herself talking and telling many people that I married the Prophet ﷺ when I was six years old. So which the, what we know, Aqd al-Qiran, which is what we call today Nikah. It's just the having the wali of the lady and the husband and the witnesses, basically the official marriage on papers, but then the actual relationship started in Medina when she was nine years old. So then Khawla radiallahu anha went to Sauda and the same thing. She, she told Sauda, do you agree? Do you want this? And she said, yes. She went to her father and the same thing. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam married both of them on this year. And subhanAllah, the brother of Sauda, he was not a Muslim at that time, and he was in Hajj. So when he came back and he heard about this marriage, 
So he started يحكو على رأسه التراب. He started taking sand and putting it on his head, and which means it's an action that shows it's a very bad thing. He didn't want this marriage to take place. Then how come? And then when he became Muslim after that, he started kind of cursing himself. He said, ما أسفهني الله. What a bad reaction I showed when I heard about the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ to my sister, basically. So, subhanAllah, one of the mo most important lessons we can extract from, especially from this story, the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ, it's again a repeated lesson that we learned from many stories before. That our religion, or the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the ultimate truth. And it's valid for all times. When we think that something is problematic with the religion of Allah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's the, there is no specific age for marriage. Whenever both man and woman are able to consume the marriage, then it's okay. It's allowed. Nowadays, no. Say, so, you no, know, we have to fix an age. And by the way, even if, 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 if a judge or an entity specifies an age, specific age for marriage. That could be fine based on <clears throat> how they define it. If they say it's not allowed, just like if they are basically following the West and saying no, the good age of marriage is 18 and that's it. It's not allowed to marry before that. So that's now it becomes halal. But if they say, okay, the average age of puberty is 13, 12, whatever, and they say, okay, that's the, that's the law according to the average age, it could be accepted. And as we see, it's always relying on the intention and how we're dealing with those issues. If we're dealing with it, that, oh, we can change our religion as we want, according to anything else, that's completely unacceptable. But sometimes if we believe that it's good for us as a community to set some laws that are not going to change halal and haram, we're not going to say it's haram, but we just think, or the scholars come together, and they study this issue, and they come with a conclusion that it's better to protect our community overall to put those rules, those laws. They are not changing again. They are not changing halal and haram, but it's just laws to make people's life better and easier. So that's completely different. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cause us to live upon Islam and die upon Islam. Jazakumullah khair.